Welcome to the ISF podcast from the Information Security Forum. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert, and I'm glad to welcome you back to our program, featuring cutting-edge conversations with business leaders and creative luminaries tailored to global security professionals. Today, Steve is in conversation with Dr. Margaret Cunningham, Principal Research Scientist at Forcepoint. Steve and Dr. Cunningham discuss leading a team that's working from home, hiring and onboarding post-COVID, and building your team's communication skills. So, Margaret, it's lovely to talk to you. You've spoken on a number of ISF sessions that we've had in the past, particularly with Dan Norman, I know, around things like human-centric security. And I want to come in onto those. I'd like to cover off some of those elements again, perhaps taking a little diversion into mental health and some of the other things that have been happening recently. But first, tell us about your career track. I mean, you started off in psychology and ended up in cybersecurity. How did that happen? It was a long and winding road, Steve. It was a little bit unexpected. If you would have asked me eight or nine years ago, if I would be doing this job, I would have thought you were nuts. I actually started out as a therapist with a master's in mental health counseling and realized pretty quickly that I'm not great one-on-one at helping people with mental health crises. (laughs) But it's good, you know, it's nice to know that about myself. And I I went on and I pursued a PhD in applied experimental psychology so that I could help at a broader scale because I really wanted to have a job where I was helping people. You know, it's funny because I started off working in healthcare and working on how technology impacted care provider performance, patient safety, things like that. And then moved on into another consulting role for Homeland Security and some other organizations in the U.S. government, working in human systems integration, which is a very broad field, everything from human factors to manpower, personnel, safety, really focused on things like physiological sensors and operational testing of new technology and human performance. And I had a side interest in cybersecurity because I feel like it really is very human performance related. And that's my passion. And, you know, I had the opportunity to join Forcepoint. And at the time, there were just so many questions to be answered. How are we going to create human-centric cybersecurity solutions? Who's going to help with the human component? And I, you know, I lucked out in that they hired me and I've had a great time working in this field for the past three or four years. That whole issue of, of the human, you know, the person, the individual, you and me, and our interrelationship with technology it is certainly one that fascinates me and perhaps I'm slightly biased, but one of the things that I've noticed is that it can all too often get lost. So when we talk about security, we very often talk about technology solutions that are going to solve problems for us. And part of that is down to the fact that there's a shortage of skills. But really, for me, it's people that are at the heart of all of that. And so I get very frustrated sometimes with vendors that keep talking to me about, you know, technology and how that's going to save the world, if you like. How do you go about resetting that dial so that we get the balance between technology, which don't get me wrong, has a whole range of benefits and the people. How do we get that balance right? It really is starting to become a little bit more welcome. And, you know, I think one of the issues is that it does seem possible that people who aren't, you know, experts in psychology or behavior understand people, right? So they will take on the role as the engineer or software developer who copes with the people issues. But the reality is, is you really do need to have the expertise in this area. Part of the battle is getting invited early enough. Right. And, you know, a lot of the wheels have been set in motion. People have development roadmaps and their development cycle and all of their sprints planned out and all of these beautiful things. And for the most part, they hadn't thought about integrating the human part into that process. So they will try and tack it on at the end where you really can't do as much good. So we really depend on people who believe in it to evangelize and bring us in early. I might not understand exactly every detail of uh, software architecture, but it certainly helps me understand what I can do later if I can see like how the data is going to move, what we're doing with it, how we're creating risk scores, all of those different factors. 
It's a real challenge, though, isn't it? Because, you know, we talk about trying to get security involved at the right stage. And now we're trying to get people involved in security. And, and, and so we're sort of working our way back, it seems to me. What, what are some tips for doing that? I mean, somebody, you know, people listening to this going, yeah, it's, I get it. But how do you actually do it? It is an investment. And it's an investment in your personnel. You've got a range of different types of behavioral scientists. You wouldn't need necessarily someone with my background to be helpful. You may already have a user experience or a user interface team that hasn't really been integrated very well. If you have those people, you can start there. And that's actually a pretty easy win for a lot of companies that have those types of human design assets on their team. But it's partially that we have to understand what cognitive scientists, designers, human factors people can offer. And in a sense, that responsibility lies on people in my field to communicate beyond the academia, beyond the peer-reviewed journals, and get ourselves out there and collaborating and communicating with people in the security field. Again, not a technological solution. No, not, not at all. Um, which leads me on to my next question, actually, which is, Who's your best friend? So within the organization, who helps you with that? Is it, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, is it the HR director? Is it the CEO? Is it the CISO? Who do you sort of align best with? Maybe it's a business leader. I, I don't know. You know, I, I fit really well in R&D groups, primarily because they're trying to do something new anyway. There's a lot of flexibility and creativity. Uh, what are we going to test? What are we going to build? What's the vision? And I tend to be very welcome in those groups because it's very open-minded. Mm -hmm. And that's a great place to start, especially because testing out new ways to integrate human stuff or measure human stuff can be very challenging. And so that sort of rapid innovation center allows us to do things more quickly, create the prototype more quickly, fail more quickly. Right. And that's critical. So I, I love the R&D centers. Let's sort of shift gears a little bit now, Margaret. You know, we've talked about the R&D piece and getting involved early. And I guess, you know, that's probably in the ideal situation. We had this thing called the pandemic, which <laughs> suddenly um, hit us from, from nowhere. And depending on which part of the world listeners happen to be in, they'll be at various different stages of lockdown or, or hopefully coming out of that. But I think what will be consistent is that it's had an impact on personal and professional lives, which have changed dramatically to reflect the shift to home and to remote working. And that has brought about a number of different changes, hasn't it, from a security standpoint? What's your take on the challenges that we've had to face there and indeed the ones that we're going to continue to have to face going forward? The challenges are enormous, but I have been relatively pleasantly surprised at how quickly organizations and even governments have moved to allowing people to work from home, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect. Things are definitely going wrong. There are definitely security concerns, but this really forced all sorts of different organizations to be much more dynamic, much more flexible, and to adapt to the environment to support their workforce and also to support their companies. It's been kind of amazing to see. That said, we have a ton of different issues with transitioning to the cloud and depending on remote access to organizational assets. And I think that is the biggest challenge for the security world. Right. You may have seen that we've just launched our Threat Horizon report that looks out to 2023. And one of the things we pulled out of that was that, you know, this permanent shift to remote working is going to raise demand for employee tracking, monitoring solutions by what's forecast to be something like 84%. And that number came out about, I think, in September last year. So it's still relatively fresh. And really, it's because things like some of the things you've mentioned already, you know, sensitive information is being shared in the home, sensitive information is being shared in the cloud. And then we've got hackers, of course, that are seeing it as an opportunity to target home Wi-Fi systems and so on. All of that really shines a light on what you were talking about earlier, which is, you know, security by design or awareness by design. But that horse has now bolted, <laughs> right? So how can we now retrofit effectively um, security awareness to combat some of the issues that I've just been talking about? Because personally, I'm not a big fan of tracking and monitoring our employees. That doesn't sit well with me from a trust perspective. Yeah, and, you know, trust is 
a huge word in our industry anyway, but we have some unspoken psychological contracts between employees and employers that are often ignored when we start doing things like behavioral monitoring of employees. Right. And that can be a huge problem because one of the things that drives insider threat or retaliatory anger from employees is feeling like they've been duped or tricked or victimized in some way. Mm -hmm. And feeling that trust relationship is actually critical for part of our security. But that said, it's going to be very difficult to retrofit something like that. And it's going to be a problem if companies think that using behavioral monitoring is a way to control. Because frankly, people don't like to be controlled all the time. Right. And um, if you do attempt to use it as a draconian control system, you'll find that human ingenuity and creativity means people will do what they want anyway. And that is worse actually trying to figure out the creative ways your employees are getting around your security is worse than being able to understand what they're doing. Right. So what does good look like? If I'm not going to go down this sort of tracking and monitoring route, what can I do? What is going to work for me to help secure some of these things that are really, you know, from a business perspective, keeping people up at night, you know, how safe is my data in somebody's home, for instance? You know, I guess, I do believe that some degree of behavioral analytics and monitoring is okay and very useful, but not in the sense that it's like creepy and tracking your productivity and making sure that you're clicking your mouse every 15 minutes and you're on all day. That's a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not very successful. Right. But when it comes to understanding something like, okay, Margaret is your psychologist. She accesses certain types of data. She moves approximately this amount of data per day. She tends to download things like this. She communicates with these people. Understanding those habits and my patterns and my role is very helpful in detecting whether or not it's really me. Mm -hmm. And also whether or not I'm doing something that's very bizarre that could be impacting the safety of the company's data. Right. So we're monitoring, looking to see how patterns change rather than digging deep into how often you're clicking on a mouse and that kind of thing, as you say. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that is critical for people to be happy in their jobs and really like happy employees make great companies is I love chatting with my coworkers. Mm -hmm. I love, you know, checking in with someone who just had a baby or got a new dog or just moved. That's fun. I mean, those are things that we take for granted in a physical office. Right. And we have to make room for those things in our distributed workforce. Uh, it's, it's really healthy. You, yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And I was going to say to you, you know, what have you seen that really works well like that? I mean, at the ISF, we've got things like coffee hours and that kind of stuff. But what else is going on out there? What is, again, what does good look like in that kind of thing? You know, it's a really difficult balance because we're burnt out on video chats. Yeah. And I, I don't know that it would be a bad idea to create an opt-in buddy system of some sort where you have a partner who you can reach out to or someone else in your organization, maybe not even on your team, mm -hmm. who you can say like, oh, I need a personal vent or this is what's going on. I don't know that that would be a bad thing. Obviously, we don't want to put a burden if somebody's really having a terrible time or breaking down. You have another employee saying, what am I supposed to do about this? But kind of fostering the relationships is critical. And this is really um, points to having great managers. Right. Great managers can do a lot of good and bad managers can do a lot of harm during these times. Somebody listening to this is probably thinking, you know, um, I'd like to be a great manager. What do I do? What are the sort of things that constitute being a great manager in this kind of remote environment from that sort of human element that you've just been talking about? Giving your team visibility, showing off what all of your team is doing, giving credit to people for smaller things sometimes, you know, sending out that email or that recognition can be very important during moments where you can't really get together and celebrate something or it's mm -hmm. difficult to show who's working on what. Having people feel that their work has a purpose, that they're valued for their work, and that their work is contributing to the goal, right? And sometimes, you know, when you are a person who's in the weeds, 
coding something, you might not hear what the big picture is anymore. Right. And that comes down to communication again, another human thing. Absolutely. You just touched on burnout. Now, last year, again, I think it was in the summer, the Chartered Institute of Information Security came out with this statistic that some people might find shocking, that 54% of security professionals, they say, leave their roles due to overwork and burnout. Now, in an industry where we constantly talk about skill shortage, where we constantly talk about the need to try to attract more people in with the right skill sets and retain people and so on, that's pretty much a self-defeating number, isn't it? Because you're constantly trying to fill the bucket and it's got a hole in the bottom. What are the sorts of things that security leaders, great managers can do to really address some of this overwork and burnout issue? I happen to be an expert in multitasking from a cognitive science perspective. Right. I look a lot at what happens when people do a lot of things at once. And if you've read job descriptions in our industry, your eyeballs just roll into the back of your head because, you know, the HR teams are asking for professionals who have 17 different types of expertise, um, sometimes even saying, you know, you've got to be an expert in this for 10 years. And, you know, the thing hasn't even been around for five. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) We're asking a lot, even on the front end. And I think that to help people avoid burnout, we have to allow people to build expertise that is a little bit more focused and to let people stay on their tasks for a little bit longer. Whether that means you need more people, whether that means you need to figure out what the workflow is, it's up to you and how you run your company. But by asking people to you know, answer phone calls, deal with escalations, watch the security, manage people on top of that, we're definitely asking too much. And you know, one of the things that if you spend time cruising around and looking at InfoSec Twitter, for instance, Mm -hmm. you'll see a lot of people saying, how do I break into this field? How do I start out? And part of being overworked is that it's difficult to delegate. It's difficult to teach. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we need to make space for. New people, training, learning, opening the door for different types of people to help with the massive workload. So if we have this challenge of overwork and burnout in the industry, and, you know, let's give it a bit of context, more than 54% means that for every two people I have, at least one of them is probably going down this road, right? So as a leader, what can somebody do to be aware of and, and watch out for something that might signal that maybe someone on their team is really struggling? Uh, listen, <laughs> and, you know, I know, I know, crazy, right? <laughs> Oftentimes we, we get in these meetings and the point of the meeting is to say, this is what I've done. This is what we're doing. This is the next thing. Let me put another task on top of your pile of things that you're already doing. When people say no, or when people are late or people are checked out, not able to complete things, that doesn't necessarily mean that the person is bad or they need a poor performance review, Mm -hmm. it may mean that they're completely maxed out. Right. And in that sense, they might be afraid to tell you. Right. Because they're afraid to lose their job. Right. Right. So listening and watching for some of these signs of burnout is um, welcome to your next task manager. (laughs) 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 See, now I'm going to burn out all the managers. (laughs) Yeah, and they're all sitting there thinking, like, you know, I'm, I'm doing uh, this remotely. How does she expect me to do that? <laughs> like, who's this Margaret lady? She's really making my life difficult. No, um, you know, but you can bake some of this into your check-ins. You know, I, I know most managers have one-on-one scheduled meetings with people who work for them. Yeah. That's very common. Whatever that looks like for you, think about whether you're hearing what someone's saying. If you've noticed their quality of work is slipping, is it because they're having a personal problem or is it because there's too much work or, or what is it? Because even acknowledging that it's a problem can take some of that bad feeling away. Right. And of course I was joking there because about people being remote, but, but we do have to learn a different set of skills, don't we? Because we are in a lot of countries at the moment, still unable to see people face to face. So we're working through 
you know, either the camera that's not working very well, or in in some instances, the camera that's working absolutely fine. Doesn't really matter. Maybe it's another well. challenge that we have. <laughs> Maybe too well. <laughs> exactly. Yes, we've we've all had instances of that, haven't we? So it's, you know, again, you know, I've identified that perhaps there is a, an issue with one individual. What is it that I can do to help them? You know, if it's something like feeling overwhelmed with work, you know, maybe you've given somebody a set of tasks that's huge, helping them create sub goals, break things down, help them prioritize what needs to be done first, what can be put on the back burner. Some people are excellent at doing this on their own. Other people are not. And that being able to chat in the office and say like, I got all this stuff to do. What are you working on? Mm -hmm. What should I be working on? We can't do that anymore. Right. So we have to craft that conversation to help people do it if it's not something that they're already very good at. And of course, that takes time, right? It does take time. Um, So it's about building that into, again, the meetings, the sessions that you have with your staff so that you're allowing for that, so that you're not trying to squeeze it in, you know, say at the end of a day. And because let's face it, the manager also can be suffering from burnout and overwork, right? (sighs) Yeah. And they're hearing about all sorts of different personnel crises, you know, like they get a lot of it, especially good managers who have strong relationships. I mean, they're serving as mental health support and work support and trying to understand people's family dynamics and helping people have different schedules. It's, it's really a lot to ask, but, you know, we have a lot of people saying, you know, that meeting could have been an email. Mm -hmm right? That's the funny joke. That meeting should have been an email. So if we can focus on making our meetings worthwhile Mm -hmm. and structure them so that people are getting something out of it, instead of having pointless meetings all the time, that can also help. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, though, because, you know, a number of people that I know will say, let's have a meeting simply because they want to see somebody on the screen right? It's not Mm -hmm. because it couldn't be done in an email or in some other way. It's because maybe they just want to see that other person, you know? And so we have to take that into account as well, I think, which is because that's an important element too, right? Yeah. You know, I have the luxury of living with people I really like. I have a great family and I have people to talk to and not everybody has that. We have a lot of people who are living alone um, and it's extremely isolating. It's hard to say what people are experiencing. Some people cope with being alone differently than others. And, um, you know, the problem is, is it's such an individual experience. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We can't say this will work for your team. This will work for your company because people are experiencing very different worlds right now. Right. And obviously, as we get back to a position where people can go into an office, a lot of enterprises are looking at creating hybrid environments, perhaps having people just come in, you know, a few days a week or introducing remote working completely for some people, which could be great for some because it means they can live in different parts of the country and and so on. But it's going to change, I think, the way in which enterprises work and also the relationship that the enterprise, the business has with the employee. And for me anyway, you know, we're just beginning to really understand some of those issues because what we've just been talking about is a very small part of what's going to become a very much more important, I think, and larger byproduct of emerging from pandemic and changing the way in which we operate. So if we could just sort of, you know, look forward a little bit now, what are the sorts of exciting challenges that you think we're going to have to face from a leadership standpoint when it comes to working with our people in this new environment that we're moving into? You know, we have a lot of turnover in our companies. A lot of people change jobs every year or two, year or three. That refresh is going to be both exciting and very challenging. Mm-hmm. How do you onboard someone who doesn't know anyone? Right. How do you get them to understand who they can reach out to? I talk to people all over the company, all different types of roles. If I hadn't have had the luxury of being in an office to get that face and that name and you know figure out who I should email or knock on their door, uh, it, it would be much more challenging than it otherwise was. Yeah. So you know, creativity in onboarding And creativity in team building is, I think, going to be actually like a hot market for someone who's good at it. Mm -hmm. Group dynamics are strange, even in the best of times. So (laughs) we're adding another layer on top of that. So, you know, the team building and onboarding and connecting and creating visibility of, you know, who you're working for, who you're working with. What is that person good at? What am I good at? How could we collaborate is really going to be 
you know, the big challenge, but also kind of exciting for people who are interested in that. So much stronger emphasis on, on softer skills, in fact. Yeah. And, you know, I never discredit how important it is to be able to write clearly. I know talking is great, but writing clearly and being able to communicate in writing, which is frankly, a fairly soft skill these days because mm -hmm. we're all just cranking out technical reports or, uh, you know, creating code or whatever. I think that's going to be really, really important. You know, I, I wouldn't think it would be a bad idea to offer, you know, business writing courses or whatever to your people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think an awareness, I guess, of the skill sets that are needed for the future, moving away perhaps from some of those technical skills, which can be taught to a certain extent, and, and more of an emphasis on some of the softer people-based elements out there, which I think for some people listening to this may come as a bit of a surprise if they're you know, embedded in the security world and thinking that what we actually need is more people who can understand AI and you know, all of that kind of stuff. Because what's interesting, and, and it's been a great conversation, what's interesting is we haven't really talked about technology, which was my purpose. <laughs> We've talked about the stuff sneaky. that makes it work, it's right? <laughs> you know, but here's the thing. If you're someone who can understand AI, you understand different types of security issues. Maybe you're a malware expert. Can you communicate that right. effectively at a broader scale? And if you can't, how can we help you build those skills? Because you know what? Communication and soft skills and presenting are also things that we can learn. It's not a, a secret club. You, you really can build skills in that area as well. And it's very valuable. I think that's a great way to finish. Margaret, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, Steve, thanks for having me. This conversation is a great reminder that just because we call the soft skills soft doesn't mean they're somehow optional. Dr. Cunningham has highlighted that good communication and empathy with one's team are necessary components of effective leadership. In our next episode, we're going to bring you something a little bit different. At ISF, we've been considering the impact of Generation Z's entry into the workforce in 2021, and we're going to consider security in the workplace from the perspective of a digital native and a more experienced security leader. We'll hear from Mahak Vora, CEO of SkillBank and a member of Gen Z, and Rich Guida, former VP of Information Security at Johnson & Johnson and current Managing Director at Guida Technology Associates, Inc. Here's Rich Guida. So most users of technology, uh, and I've seen this over the years, they adopt the technology. They, as what I like to call, whistle past the graveyard, which means um, basically something bad hasn't happened to them. And so therefore, they're fat, dumb, and happy, and they enjoy it. It makes their life better, which is good. You know, it makes their lives better. But they don't think about what bad things can happen as a consequence of the use of that technology until the bad things happen. They may even hear news stories about bad things happening to others, but it doesn't relate to them unless it happens to a family member or a good friend or to them themselves. We look forward to bringing you more in next week's episode. In the meantime, we invite you to visit securityforum.org, where you can find our catalog of video and podcast episodes. We invite you to follow the audio feed wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd be so grateful if you'd recommend us. Growing our audience helps us reach new listeners and continue to bring you these timely discussions. Join in the conversation on our LinkedIn page by searching CEO Steve Durbin or Security Forum. You can also directly download from ISF's website the research, practical tools, and guidance that we discuss in conversations like these. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert. Music by Alexander Filipiak. Associate producer Katie Flood. Mix and master by Brian Barney. Thanks for listening.